All right. Well, I wanted to welcome everybody to our very first uh, Friends Second Tuesday Zoom presentation. Uh, we are recording the session to make it available later on. Uh, my name is Rick Shields. I'm president of the Friends of the Savannah Coastal Wildlife Refuges. And even though we've been pretty much in hibernation for the last year and a half, we are still here. We're still looking forward to getting back to some semblance of normal activities uh, before too long, which would include opening our book and nature store, opening the visitor center, restarting up our, uh, our shuttle uh, tours at uh, Pinckney. But uh, we are still waiting to hear from Fish and Wildlife when, when, we're, uh, when we're going to be allowed to do that. In this series, uh, the second Tuesday series, we plan on presenting both educational and informational uh, presentations each month, at first exclusively over Zoom, but hopefully by the spring, if things are lightening up in terms of the pandemic, uh, we're hope to ha start having some live programs as well and start utilizing the, uh, the Beach Hill Pavilion which uh, we had our grand opening ceremony in March of last year and six days later it closed for the duration. So we have not been able to utilize that. But uh, we would like to at some point then be able to morph into a combination of, uh, of Zoom presentations or some other way to stream it in combination with live programs at the pavilion. And we've already got a couple of people interested in doing that. So um, keep our fingers crossed on this. And if we don't have another surge or another variant show up, hopefully by end of spring, things are gonna be looking a whole lot better. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have two very qualified uh, presenters uh, to discuss two of my favorite local reptiles, uh, loggerhead sea turtles and diamondback terrapins. Uh, Chris Williams, which many of you know, is the director of the Credit Research Project and has been for many years. Uh, she is also the uh, secretary treasurer on her friend's board of directors, has been on our board and been a uh, uh, supporter for many, uh, many years as well. Uh, she's going to go first and then we'll uh, take some questions. And what I will ask is if you have questions that come up during either presentation, please enter them in the chat box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see chat. You know, just click on chat. And then uh, you can direct that to uh, whoever. Uh, I would suggest instead of everyone, you direct it to me. Um, but if it's everyone, don't worry. That just means everybody at the meeting will get to see the question as well. What I'll do is during the presentation, we'll curate those, um, those questions. And then I'll, I'll ask them of Chris at the end of her talk. And then uh, after that, we'll turn the meeting over to uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Craven, who's a biology professor at the Armstrong campus of Georgia Southern University. She's the organizer of TERPS, the Terrapin Educational Research Project of Savannah. Um, she's also a member of our board. Uh, together, they represent many years of education, of research, and teaching uh, about these two fascinating reptiles. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy the, the, the program. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. And please keep your mics uh, uh, muted during the presentation. I do want to take this uh, opportunity just to, to shout out a nice shout out to uh, Fran and Denny Bear. Uh, and of Hilton Head, many of you know them, I suspect, through their involvement in a number of organizations, but they've been loyal supporters of ours for years, and they always give us a very nice annual contribution. This year, in view of the, they know the difficulties financially we've had because our bookstore has been closed, they uh, up their, their contribution significantly. And uh, the nice thing about that is they get a two to one match from their former employer from the Coca-Cola uh, Foundation. So thanks Fran and Denny, they couldn't be here tonight, but uh, uh, I asked them if it was okay if I mentioned their name. I won't mention the amount they gave, but it was very nice. That was a very nice contribution. And we're looking forward to getting the, the matching grant from, uh, you know, from the Coca-Cola Foundation. All right, you guys didn't sign up to listen to me talk. What I'm gonna do is turn this over to um, uh, Chris right now, uh, just make her the host and then she can start uh, with her presentation. And Chris, there you go. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Rick. And thank all of you for, oh, did I share? Did I share my screen? Okay. All right. I apologize in advance for technical difficulties, just in case I have them. Um, but thank you all for coming out um, and for the, the nice introduction, Rick. Um, we're going to be talking about sea turtles and diamondback terrapins tonight. I'm going to cover sea turtles, and then my friend and colleague, uh, Catherine Craven, will, will cover terrapins of the low country. <clears throat> so the first thing that I get asked when people hear that I work with sea turtles is, 
why? <laughs> why do you protect sea turtles? Why do you care about sea turtles? Why do we need to protect them? And sea turtles are extremely important. They maintain the health in the, of the ocean and the beach ecosystems and their roles in this, in this uh, maintenance are very species specific. For example, green sea turtles maintain healthy seagrass beds, just like when you know, your lawn gets high and you mow your lawn, it seems to grow back healthier and faster. <laughs> That's what happens when sea turtles graze on seagrass beds. It increases productivity and nutrient content. And seagrass beds are, are important uh, breeding grounds and developmental areas for commercially valuable fish and invertebrate species. Hawksbill sea turtles maintain healthy coral reefs. Um, they, for, they feed on sponges and all, sponges can uh, overwhelm and choke coral reefs. So when the hawksbills come and graze on the, the sponges, that increases the productivity and nutrient content of the coral reefs. Leatherback sea turtles maintain a balanced food web. They are a top jellyfish predator and one leatherback can eat up to 440 pounds of leatherback, of, I'm sorry, of jelly jellyfish a day. And jellyfish eat um, uh, larvae of fish, so they affect commercially important fish stocks. So it's always important to keep um, the jellyfish uh, stocks in check. They also provide food for fish. If you've ever seen a loggerhead um, in the water or nesting on the beach, many times, especially a loggerhead, many times they are just covered with epibionts. We've identified over 110 different plants and animals that they utilize and grow um, and live on the, the carapace, the back shells of sea turtles, and they provide food for fish and other organisms. And they also provide food for fish and everything else on the beach. Um, everything on the beach and in the water seems to love sea turtle eggs and hatchlings. Our worst predators on Wassa are raccoons, um, red foxes, and now coyotes. Um, we, ha we haven't had any predation yet by coyotes, but we know that they're there and it's coming. So we're, we're trying to protect the nest from them as well. They also maintain healthy dune systems. All sea turtles lay their eggs at the base of dunes or, or a little bit up higher in the dunes. And after a nest is hatched, or even if it doesn't hatch, anything left over within the nest provides nutrients for the dune vegetation to grow and, and uh, maintain healthy dunes. And everybody wants healthy dune systems because they protect the mainland from storms. So that's why sea turtles are important. And why, why had their numbers declined? If they're so important, why had their numbers de um, declined so much? Um, what threats are they facing uh, now? One of the main threats is beachfront development. Everybody wants to live and vacation at the beach. We always do, but developing beachfronts do take away uh, nesting habitat and degrade nesting habitat for sea turtles. Along with beachfront development comes beachfront lighting. Um, White lights or the short wavelengths really disorient both the hatchlings and the, the nesting female turtles. So it's always good when we're on the beach, we always use red lights because um, that distracts them less or disorients them less. And also many, you know, we all, we all need lighting at the beach at night for the safety of, of us, for all the people. So now there are lots of hotels and parking lots and areas that are adopting a longer wavelength a sea turtle friendly light um, for their beachfront properties. And you can tell it makes a, a huge difference. Also commercial fishing. Um, when commercial fishing season opens, sea turtle strandings do increase. Um, they get caught in nets and trawls um, and also uh, fishing hooks. But one, uh, one thing that, that has prevented a lot of sea turtle deaths in recent years was um, a Georgia shrimper from Darien, his name was Sinky Boone. He developed a trawler excluder device. So a lot of times in the media, you'll hear them referred to as turtle excluder devices or TEDs, but he developed them um, years ago, mainly uh, for the cannonball jellyfish, which is on the right. So the cannonball jellyfish are really solid, solid masses of jelly, you know, and the trawl through a school full of cannonball jellyfish. They don't just swish through the nets like other jellyfish. You have to lift the nets and that just wastes 
um, you know, sort time and gas and ultimately money. So what a TED is, it's a grate that they place in the base of the net and anything their target catch size or smaller will go through the grate and, and get caught in the base of the net. And anything larger just gets bounced off of that grate and ejected through a, a trap door. And also climate change. Um, with clim as climate changes, we're expecting more severe storms and sea level rise. Um, this will produce a result in increased flooding of nests and loss of nesting habitat. Um, and also it'll warm the beaches. Sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination, which means their sex is determined um, by the temperature generally in the middle third of development and hotter temperatures produce more female turtles. So that we're expecting a more, um, more females produced on the beach. And of course, pollution, everybody's seen the, the campaigns for no more plastic straws or, or plastic bags or single use plastics. And we, we clean up so much trash on the beach. Um, the bottom left picture is, a, is a, a picture of some of our colleagues on Osaba Island. This, this picture and, and uh, the text went viral a couple years ago. Um, and we, we pick up hundreds and hundreds of balloons every year. We also collaborate with Clean Coast, which is a really awesome local group who goes to each barrier island um, throughout the summer. They hadn't during COVID, but hopefully they'll pick it up again next year. And they've done it for years. And we, we work with them in August and pick up all the trash on the beach and, and take their volunteers so they can cover more of the beach. Okay, so those are some reasons that uh, that turtles have declined in the past. We'll go over a few more um, in the following slides. But there are four main species of sea turtles that you can find in Georgia. Greens, leatherbacks, chemstridlies, and loggerheads. Green sea turtles are, they're more tropical nesters, but we get anywhere from three to 10 nests in Georgia per year. Um, their main threats were poaching of adults and eggs. And the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a shot of, this is an old, old shot of a, of a slaughterhouse in, in South America, um, where, they, where they got turtles as they came up to lay their eggs. Leatherback turtles are also more tropical nesters. They sporadically nest in Georgia, and their main threats are commercial fisheries and egg collection. Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are the most endangered species of sea turtle in the world, but they are the second most common off of the Georgia coast. And they nest typically in arabadas. Arabadas is a Spanish word that means the arrival. And every 14 to 18 days, the wind starts blowing down on Rancho Nuevo in Mexico where 95% of their nesting takes place. And all of a sudden, mostly during the day, they will just storm, <laughs> storm the beach <laughs> and thousands will nest at a time. And their main threats were egg collection and poaching. Then of course, there's the loggerhead sea turtle and, and the loggerheads are what we mostly see on Wausau. And that's what I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. Okay, so what are we doing in Georgia to help sea turtles? What are we doing to reverse this decline? We are a part of the Georgia Sea Turtle Cooperative, which is led by Georgia DNR. Um, it's comprised of all 13 barrier islands in Georgia. And the goal is to maintain the viability of marine turtle populations in Georgia. Okay, the Coretta Research Project is, um, is a joint project from the Savannah Science Museum, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Savannah Coastal Refuges, the Nature Conservancy, and the Wausau Island LLC. And it's operated only on Wausau National Wildlife Refuge. And the goals are to learn more about sea turtle reproductive biology and the population trends in Georgia, to increase the survival rate of eggs and hatchlings on a beach where historically most were taken um, by either predators or spring tides, and also to educate and involve the public in a hands-on experience with sea turtle conservation. And two aspects make it unique. Um, Corada is the longest continuously run saturation tagging program in the US, which means that we are on the beach 
all night, every night throughout the summer, intercepting the, ne the nesting females and making sure that they have tags so we can, we can associate an individual with a, with a nest and have a long-term reproductive history for each sea turtle. And that makes us very attractive to um, collaborating research organizations. And the second reason is we are a volunteer-based program. We're run sort of like a, a small-scale Earthwatch program where people pay to come out for a full week experience for 17 weeks throughout the summer. And that we, it, it's very hands-on, everybody gets dirty. <laughs> um, and they just, they learn a lot about sea turtle biology. They participate directly in conserving um, loggerheads. And then they can go back to their hometowns as ambassadors for sea turtle conservation. Okay, so we take up to the accommodations on Wausau Island. It is a national wildlife refuge, but we stay on a private parcel of property that's still owned and maintained by the original owners of the island from the 1860s. And the accommodations are very rustic. It is a step up from camping. Um, we take up to six people per week. There's no electricity in the volunteer cabin, but there is an indoor toilet and an outdoor cold water shower which throughout the summer feels really good. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only relief out there. Um, and in the staff cabin, there is limited electricity so you can charge phones and camera batteries and, and tablets. So every night we go out and we patrol the beach looking for loggerheads or looking for sea turtles. Um, we ride typically with red lights or without lights. And it's really easy to see these tracks. That's what we're looking for when we're riding up and down the beach, is looking for these tracks. It, and these turtles are about 250 to 350 pounds, so it's easy to see. It looks like a tractor just rolled out of the surf and headed up to the dunes. So once we see these tracks, we turn off the mules and we will kind of sneak up the track to see what the turtle, what stage the turtle is at in her, in her nesting. Because if she's still kind of wandering around up there, or um, just starting to dig her nest, she's easily spooked and we don't want to spook her. So we usually wait till she's deposited about 20 to 30 eggs, about halfway done with her nest. And that's when we, we um, start collecting all of our data. So data collection includes making sure that they have two flipper tags, one on each front flipper, and also a pit tag, like a microchip, like um, that's put in your dogs and cats. We take measurements and we also take, um, collect lots of samples for our in-house research as well as um, our collaborating research partners. Okay, a little bit about loggerhead reproductive biology. Um, uh, oh no, sorry, there we go. Okay, it takes about 25 to 35 years for a loggerhead to reach sexual maturity. When they do, they don't nest typically every two every year, but every two to four years. Average clutch size is about 120 eggs per nest. And during the years that they nest, they'll lay anywhere from four to eight nests per season. So each individual turtle deposits anywhere from 500 to 1,000 eggs per season. And it's estimated that one, one in 1,000 hatchlings will reach adulthood. So after they deposit their nests, we protect them with screens to make sure that none of the predators that are on the island can, can take any of the eggs. Sometimes we have to relocate the nest. If the turtle deposits the nest um, like on or below the high water mark, we'll just relocate it a little bit up, um, up higher in the dune line just to make sure that they're not flooded by the next spring tides. And then if you're lucky, you can witness an emergence. And I'm gonna try and do this smoothly. <laughs> okay. This is a, a time-lapse video um, of over an hour. The volunteers waited for, for this nest to hatch. But sometimes you get, have to be really lucky to, to witness a boy like this. I think you might have to change the presentation that you're sharing. Oh, oh no. Did it, did it not work? No, it's we just see the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Yeah, we're not seeing video. Oh, shoot. Okay.
Um, yeah, just try minimizing the, uh, you know, the Oh, minimize the PowerPoint? Okay. How about that? No, we're still seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, shoot, it's minimized. Oh, bummer, okay. Um, how about if I do this? I'll try one more thing. Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Well, Sorry about that. To go, Chris. What we'll do is just post that video along with the uh, the video from the lecture, so that okay. we can look at it later on. All right, it's on our Facebook page. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so what is what is going on um, with Wausau? Some I'll give you some Wausau stats. This was the 49th year of the program. Next year is the 50th anniversary. Big celebration. <laughs> so in 49 years, we've seen six individual green turtles that have deposited 10 nests and produced 461 hatchlings. We've had two individual leatherback turtles deposit two nests that produced 63 hatchlings. One Kemp's Ridley nest, we're the first nest in Georgia, um, that produced 36, 36 hatchlings. And then we've identified over 1,930 individual loggerhead sea turtles. And we've protected over 5,440 nests and produced over um, 373,000 hatchlings um, and, and counting. <laughs> this year isn't done yet. <laughs> so the 2021 update, <laughs> excuse me, we had 316 nests. This is the third highest year um, that we've experienced in, um, in the 49 years. And it's only the third time that we've broken 300. We've had 112 individual turtles and four of those were new turtles that we hadn't seen nesting before. It doesn't mean that that's their first nest, it's just new to Wausau. Right now, we still have three remaining in the ground and over 18,200 hatchlings have emerged so far. In Georgia, Georgia had 2,500 nests this year, 15 are still in the ground and over 148,000 hatchlings have emerged. So one of the big take home messages here is that conservation works. Um, this is, like I said, this is the 49th year of the project. Um, all islands have been protecting nests since 1989, which is 32 years. And it does take 25 to 35 years for these turtles to reach sexual maturity. So the turtles that we're seeing now are the result of all of the prior conservation efforts back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So we're really grateful to, the people back then that had the foresight to start protecting nests and tagging turtles and, and studying them back then. Research on the island, we've provided data support and infrastructure for more than 55 publications in peer-reviewed journals, five PhD dissertations, and six master's theses, authored over 40 research presentations, and our current long-term collaborations are um, University of Florida, University of Georgia, and also Georgia Southern University, both Armstrong and Statesboro campuses. Volunteerism and education. We have worked with over 3,400 volunteers, <laughs> excuse me, since 1973. Um, average is about 85 volunteers per year. Ages have ranged from 14 to 82, and there is no typical volunteer. Um, we get students, retirees and everybody in between. The common thread is that they love sea turtles and wanna protect them. And you meet some really cool people that way. We've had people from 46 states and seven countries and about half of our volunteers are repeat volunteers. Um, about half of them, they come back every year or, or you know, every, every few years. They love the project, they love the turtles, they tell their friends or they keep the project to themselves because this is kind of their thing. And then um, we do have a lot of people that by the end of the week, they're on the dock counting their bug bites <laughs> and they tell me this was really cool, the turtles were awesome, but you won't see me again. <laughs> but we've also trained 29 interns who have, many of whom have gone on to um, biological or environmental education careers. So what can you do? Um, 
you can participate on the Corona Research Project or other beach projects if, if you know, you're along Georgia or even up in South Carolina. Um, volunteers, we're always looking as for boat captains to help transport crews over to Wausau and, um, from Landings Harbor. Also, you can educate people on the beach. I still see people using white lights and, and harassing turtles and, and even putting kids on turtles when they're nesting. So please just you know educate people that you see on the beach. And if you call authority, uh, if you find a nest or a strand of turtles, please call the authorities. Um, always, we always leave the beach cleaner than where we found it. Um, if, and if you're interested in going to sea, uh, the rest of the barrier islands, Clean Coast is a great group to um, join and help clean the help clean up the beach and also see the coast. Reduce single use plastics, which will be a huge help in, in reducing what we find on the beach. And also, um, if you've got a boat, we just ask that voters be aware. Um, these are reptiles, so they do breathe air. They pop up to the surface of the ocean to breathe. And we are seeing more and more um, stranded turtles, live, live and dead with uh, prop wounds, just because there are, are so many more boats in the water now. So we just ask people to keep their eyes open for, for breathing turtles. <laughs> Hey, and thank you so very much for, for listening to the talk about turtles and I am happy to answer any questions. And please, if um, our, our, research, our website is paretoresearchproject.org and you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and there are awesome pictures if you're interested. Thank you. Well, Chris, thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions coming in yet. Does anybody out there have any questions for Chris? Do I stop sharing? Okay, stop sharing. And then if you would uh, make me the host again, oh, uh, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Um, did that work? All right, thank okay. you. I am the host now. Okay. All right, if there's no questions, then we're going to have to move right on ahead. <laughs> And we're right on schedule here, actually. So we're going to move on ahead. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, Catherine, I'm going to make you the host. And then in a minute, you can start sharing here. Give me a second. Catherine, you should be the host now. But Catherine, you are muted. Okay. I'm hoping, <clears throat> I hope that this is working. And I'd like to thank um, thank Rick and the friends, and thank you so much, Chris, for your wonderful uh, beginning of the presentation. It is just my pleasure to be here with everybody, and always, always my pleasure to talk about the turtles. Um, the diamondback terrapins that I work with are, uh, you know, absolutely wonderful animals, and it is my uh, dear and second love only to the sea turtles that began my career. So. As, uh, as I came to the Georgia coast, I was working with loggerhead sea turtles. I've been a collaborator of Chris and the Wausau project for many, many years, but it was another collaborator, um, Jordan Gray of the Turtle Survival Alliance, who got me involved with the Diamondback Terrapins. And together we founded a research group called the Terrapin Educational Research Program of Savannah. Um, so we've been on the Georgia Southern uh, Armstrong campus since 2004. And this is a group that you'll learn more about as I continue with the presentation. So as we go forward, the, the Diamondback Terrapin is a low country turtle, but they are not exclusive to the low country. They are exclusive, however, to the salt marsh habitat. And so if you look at the map, you'll see that the salt marsh habitat 
Um, the Spartina salt marsh habitat in particular is native to the US East Coast and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So this habitat begins up in Cape Cod and it goes all the way down the coast and into the Gulf of Mexico to Corpus Christi, Texas. So what you'll find is that these marsh turtles are exclusive to this area and the brackish water. They do not go all the way out into the ocean where the full strength seawater is located like the sea turtles do. And they don't go inland into the upper parts of the freshwater rivers and they do not live in freshwater ponds like a lot of the freshwater turtles we see in our area as well. That makes them really unique and really special. You'll see that this includes a lot of our National Wildlife Refuge habitats in our area. That includes the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, the Wausau Island National Wildlife Refuge, Pickney Island, Harris Neck, and all the way down the coast in other states uh, where they would have protected areas as well. Oops, I'm gonna, sorry about that. I'm gonna have to use my buttons. Okay, so looking at the actual animals, you'll see that the females in this case are much, much larger than the males. That is something that is not true for sea turtles. Uh, it takes a little getting used to, that actually is a result of the females needing to carry the eggs and the body size for the males just is not necessarily uh, going to accommodate those uh, reproductive needs. That makes it easy to spot when you have a male. If you have an animal uh, such as the one you see on the left-hand side of the screen, that's either going to be a male or it's gonna be a juvenile diamondback terrapin. Anybody who is going to be larger than the male, which is roughly uh, six inches in length, is going to be either a male or a juvenile. If it's bigger than a male, it's going to, uh, if it's bigger than that six inches, it's going to be a female. Another thing which is very striking about the diamondback terrapin is the difference in the patterns and the color. Uh, morphology that you see in these turtles. They are so, so variable. These animals that you see are just a few of the examples of little terrapins that we happen to have hatched. I'll get into that uh, in more detail in just a moment. But this is a great example of the cross-section of the colors and the patterns that you can see in the wild. Just, it is uh, research suggests that this is some of a combination of both the genetics of the diamondback terrapins and possibly the environmental factors as well. Their diet is really variable and their ecological roles in the salt marsh as predators, you can see that they eat a variable diet, including little snails, um, a lot of different crabs, including the fiddler crabs, and things such as shrimp. They also eat mo uh, mollusks like uh, different clams, and that that variability can really affect the marsh ecology. There are several different ideas about how the diamondback terrapin helps through their diet to affect the health overall of the marsh ecosystem. As prey, the diamondback terrapins, when they're small, certainly are going to become food for certain kinds of fish that are found in the marsh. And as they get bigger, it's pretty well known that the diamondback terrapins are also eaten by birds of prey, things like osprey. Uh, it's not uncommon to find a pile of diamondback terrapin shells next to um, a, an osprey nest or other birds of prey that are much larger than the diamondback terrapins. So they play both a predator and a prey role in the marsh. Let's talk about the diamondback terrapin lifestyle for a moment. Um, they are reptiles, which means they are cold-blooded. They're going to be um, at the mercy of the water temperature and the air temperature. So they will be found very frequently up on the banks basking, getting some warmth from the sun. 
And when, um, when it's cooler, they are going to be slowing down. And when it's warmer, they're going to be warming up. So um, that's part of what their lifestyle is going to be like. Uh, they also, of course, are air breathers. So they'll have to come up to the surface of the water for taking breaths. They also have been found through our research to have home creeks. So they're very particular about which little, um, you know, which little portion of the creek they're going to call home. And they do move around. So some of them will go from one, uh, one home creek to a, a different part of a tidal river, and then they'll come back. So they can be tracked uh, and they'll move around a good bit within a certain marsh system. But for the most part, you can consider them to have home regions. We think they live uh, in the neighborhood of about 30 years, but it, they do mature uh, in about four to six years. Their breeding season is roughly from April to July. It depends on which part of their, uh, which part of the nation they live in. They tend to breed a little bit earlier in the Southern states and a little bit later in the Northern states. And as I said, in the colder months, they start to slow down and ultimately they stop eating in about November and then they'll go down to the bottom of the marsh mud and they start to hibernate. We call it brumation in reptiles. And so they basically slow their metabolism down to the point where they're barely breathing, they're, bare, they're not eating, and they'll stay down in the marsh mud until about um, early spring, about March. So their whole metabolism slows down. And even uh, the diamondback terrapins, which we have in a little population on the Armstrong campus of Georgia Southern, go through this annual brumation cycle. They just follow the natural rhythms as if they were living out in the wild. Now, what we do know about the diamondback terrapins is that there used to be a lot more of them. A long time ago, in about the early 1800s, uh, it was really common that humans uh, have eaten turtle for many, many generations, I should say. They ate turtles from freshwater, they ate sea turtles, they ate marsh turtles, and it was something that was really basically a subsistence food item. There were plenty of them, they were free, all you had to do is go catch them no matter where you were. Well, it became very fashionable in the mid 1800s, late 1800s to eat diamondback terrapin in particular. And as you see, there's a recipe on the slide that shows you that diamondback terrapin stew, especially from the Chesapeake Bay, Maryland area, uh, became incredibly fashionable. And it actually became quite a delicacy. And because of that, it was served in restaurants uh, in very high density areas where the human population just had a, much, a, gr a growing demand for this particular item. And throughout their range, diamondback terrapins became so popular, they became over harvested. And this continued until prohibition. If you look at the recipe, and I can use my cursor to highlight this little red asterisk. This particular part of the recipe, if you can't read it, says three cups of sherry wine. And in the 1920s, of course, prohibition went into effect and it was the difficulty in obtaining sherry wine for most people and most restaurants that actually saved the diamondback terrapin. Because when you could not make this terrapin stew properly, most people stopped eating it and the demand declined. And so the demand for the terrapins declined. But this heyday of terrapin stew, declined, it decreased the population of terrapins so dramatically that we don't even know how close they might have come to extinction. Locally, this famed terrapin, um, on Isle of Hope in Chatham County, 
we know the Barbie Terrapin Farm um, was it was built in 1893, and the Barbie family, which is still around today, actually gained such notoriety because they found a way to hatch terrapins, which was very, very difficult. And this was believed to be the only diamondback terrapin farm in existence. Now, I don't know, I don't know if that's absolutely true, but it was, um, he hatched, Barbie had Alex Barbie hatched the first diamondback terrapin egg that was known, at least in the state of Georgia. And he continued to raise and hatch terrapins and sell them as a meat product. And um, I believe he exported them up the coast toward the New York area. And it was um, self-supporting until about 1929. I think that was when he died. So this was a very well-known uh, location that centered around the terrapin trade. And you can see that little terrapins, as you see in this picture, these are not Barbie's terrapins. These are actually some of the Armstrong terrapins that had been hatched, but this is what they look like when they're uh, only about two months old. But this was really a, a point of great notoriety for the Savannah area. So the Terrapin populations never really recovered from all of that hunting pressure based on the need and the desire for Terrapin stew. Now we consider them in the state of Georgia, at least a species of concern, which means that they're protected by the state, but we don't really know how many there are. We know they're really a lot less than there should be. We believe that they're a lot less than there used to be, but getting a very reliable estimate on what the current population is in the wild is a very difficult thing to do. So a lot of researchers which are interested in terrapins are trying to do what we can to monitor populations and most uh, more importantly than ever we're trying to mitigate or or reduce the threats that these animals are facing in the wild and the two most important threats that we're trying to reduce are the mortality that the terrapins face as a result of getting trapped in the crab pots that people use to fish for blue crabs. That is a crab pot that you see at the bottom left-hand side of the screen. And in order to do that, we use TEDs, just like Chris had mentioned, the turtle excluder devices that are used on shrimp trawlers to stop sea turtles from getting caught in shrimp nets. You can use turtle excluder devices to stop diamondback terrapins from getting inside of blue crab pots. What happens is these little plastic devices are put over the funnels that are serving as entry points into the crab pot. There are also other varieties of these turtle excluders, but the point being that if you can stop the turtles from getting in by making it too small for their shell to fit, then you can stop the turtles from getting in the crab pot and therefore they won't drown. The thing is the crab pots, like the one you see on the right-hand side of the screen, they are held down underwater and then there's a buoy that tells you where they are at the surface of the marsh water, of the, of the tidal creek. Well, the turtle, if it gets under the water, can't reach the surface anymore, so they drowned. And you can get a lot of turtles in one crab pot. This is a crab pot that lost its buoy, which meant it was ghost fishing. That's how we refer to crab pots or other fishing gear that gets lost when the owner can't find it again, if it loses its buoy or floats away or gets dragged out by the tide. This particular Crab pot had over 90 terrapin shells inside of it. Really what happens is if you get a male inside that crab pot, a lot of times, or if you, if you get a female inside the crab pot, males will follow or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. The point is too many turtles died inside that one pot 
And it's not a unique circumstance. This was just an extreme circumstance. One of the other major causes of mortality, again, this is a local example. It's not the only example. Road mortality can occur on any coastal causeway. Our coastal causeway is Highway 80 out to Tybee Island. We have many of those coastal causeways in our state, but again, other states with coastal causeways see the same type of mortality. What happens is the road is, cost, is crossing nesting habitat. So what you're going to get is mainly female terrapins that are moving around looking for good nesting habitat. And when they find a, a, a location where they're going to encounter high ground, they may not know it's leading to asphalt. And as they try to maneuver onto a good nesting area, they find themselves on a roadway. And unfortunately, it can lead to an interaction with a vehicle. The vehicles can't swerve or stop in time. And if she gets hit, um, it can cause death. And there is really sometimes nothing that can be done uh, if she isn't found in time. We do make a lot of effort to encounter these animals, mend them if possible. And if not, we part of our mission as the Terps a group is to take the eggs if they're still viable and we try to incubate them. We try to replace that poor female in the population by incubating the eggs and releasing any hatchlings that we can, we can uh, rescue. So, oops, sorry. This road mortality is not uncommon on Highway 80. Looking at this map, you're gonna see that the left-hand side of the map is the Bull River Bridge. So that would be the Thunderbolt area. On the right-hand side of the map, you're looking at Tybee Island. So to the, the, um, the upper part of the map, you see the Savannah River. And to the lower part of the map, you're seeing the extensive marsh system. We have noticed that the terrapins that you see embedded in the map, <clears throat> excuse me, these terrapins tend to cross down across Highway 80. Here we have terrapins that tend to cross down across Highway 80. And then this is the boat ramp at Lazarado Creek. These terrapins tend to cross toward the Savannah River. And we tend to see this every year from May to July on Highway 80. It depends on how many terrapins get encountered every year. We've seen numbers as low as 70 dead terrapins, but we've also seen up to 100 or 200 terrapins in as little as a one to two weekends. So there can be very large numbers of terrapins that get encountered and killed on this road each year. Oops. We call these terrapin hot zones. And what you're looking at is uh, an embellished version of the map showing you the tidal creeks where these terrapins are probably living as their home range. Like I said, they tend to have home creeks, but these hot zones are where the females are trying to cross the road while they look for nests, nesting areas. Now, the other thing which we're going to uh, associate with this same region, this Highway 80 area going out to Tybee, is remembering that one of the ecological roles of this whole marsh system is to act as a storm buffer. The entire coastal region of Georgia and South Carolina, of course, is very extensively covered in Spartina salt marsh. The role of these areas of marsh and barrier islands are to absorb some of the storm surge and absorb all of the wave energy associated with coastal storms. When we think about some of the impacts that come along with climate change and that come along with sea level rise, these are real concerns that we're dealing with as a coastal community. And we need to think about 
how these impacts might affect some of these species of concern, and in the case of sea turtles, endangered species. When the Department of Transportation is considering what to do with these coastal causeways and highways, we need to think about how those changes might affect these species of concern and all of the critical habitat that goes along with keeping them safe. Looking back at Highway 80, we need to think about how it's acting, um, how it bisects the developmental habitat and the nesting habitat and the home ranges of the Diamondback Terrapin. Because just as an example, looking back at 2015, we can see what effects were found during what we call the king tides that were very uh, well-defined during 2015. We have seen them since. This is an example. Um, I borrowed this image from WSAV News 3, which is our local, uh, one of our local news stations. I didn't have a helicopter, so I'm borrowing their images. But it's dramatic to see this is Highway 80. This is Ty the causeway going out to Tybee. Tybee was cut off for hours during this King Tide event. The entire roadway was submerged. And so this brings up concerns, of course, for the Department of Transportation. This brings up many concerns. So if they're going to modify this roadway, we need to think about the critical habitat, the endangered species, the protected species. How is it going to be impacted if they're going to modify these roads? This is the beginning of some of these concerns. We're not expecting climate um, the sea level rise to be declining anytime soon. This is probably an issue which is going to grow in the near future. So we need to be thinking about uh, how we manage some of these issues for us and for the animals. So what can we do right now? Well, the Terrapin Educational Research Program of Savannah uh, has been very active in the education, the conservation and the protection of the Diamondback Terrapins since we've become established. Uh, at the university, we have had the pleasure of interacting with amazing students uh, in the biology department. We've also had students from other departments that have been very interested and more than welcome to, to participate in any aspect of the program that they would like to. We have had over 95 student volunteers taking care of the animals, looking after them, you know, filling up water or feeding them or helping with releases. That's where some of these images are coming from. We've released over 500 little terrapins. This is an example of uh, one of the females who had been hit by a car. You can see that she had her shell cracked. She was not permanently injured. She can be mended. Reptiles have a tremendous ability to recover. Uh, as long as they can be free from uh, infection and they are tended to in a very short time period. If they do succumb to their injuries, we take them to campus, we incubate the eggs. The eggs, you know, we have had tremendous success getting the eggs to, to hatch and we have these little terrapins and we have had tremendous support uh, from the local news, you saw um, WSAV, the Savannah Morning News, and we have had a lot of support for the program from a lot of local journalists. We're so incredibly grateful for it. over 27 news and news and new newspaper articles, live and in print, to to get the word out on what's going on, how you can slow down when you're driving and look for the animals and what we can do just to be more aware of what uh, dangers are out there. We have outstanding community partners. We don't mend the turtles ourselves, but we have veterinarians uh, who work with wildlife at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center 
at Oatland Island Wildlife Center, Dr. Leslie Mailer, Dr. Terry Norton, um, do amazing work and, and donate their efforts. The Turtle Survival Alliance, as I said, um, Jordan Gray is a co-founder of the, the Terps program, and he is an alum of the university, and he is a nonstop supporter of everything that we do to this day. We have little turtles that go as ambassadors to Oatland Island Wildlife Center and Tybee Island Marine Science Center, again, working with alumni, working with volunteers, and they are living in those locations to help everybody know that they are in our marshes, that they have challenges as a species, and we just want them to be um, you know, little ambassadors to let people know that they are worthy of everybody's attention. So I just wanna thank everybody for listening uh, about some of my favorite animals and please enjoy them because they're very special and unique to our beautiful coastline. So I'm happy to take any questions that anyone would like to offer. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, also with Chris for these presentations. Um, I really like your, uh, your PowerPoints look a lot better than mine. I'm glad you guys did this instead of me. So, uh, but I would, uh, again, like to thank everybody uh, who has participated. I don't have any questions showing up. Anybody else have a question they want to uh, jump in with? I've got to see from uh, Allison. They also have awesome merchandise. Who are you speaking about there, Allison? The Terp people? Just the Coretta Research Project. Our credit, okay. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they provided the uh, they provided uh, some um, prizes for us at our last uh, auction, actually from uh, from Coretta. I do have a question here: uh, If we raised Highway 80, could there be turtle passageways? I assume you passageways under the uh, the highway. Is that something that's uh, a possibility or been discussed at all, Catherine? Do you know? In my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> we have been we have been working with the Department of Transportation for 15 years. We've had we've tried to participate in every conversation that they would allow us to participate in. The the underpass turtle tunnels would be the ideal situation. The last thing that they did was I want to say 2018 when they when or 2019 when they raised the whole bed of the highway about eight inches. If you recall when they had, um, they had barriers up on either side of Highway 80, it was during the summer um, and people thought that those were turtle barriers. They were of course debris barriers that are required anytime you do road work. It did keep the turtles off the highway, um, but unfortunately, the, the permanent bed raising and the turtle tunnels is way out of their budget. And so it isn't possible yet. But like I said, in my dreams. <laughs> All right, any other questions for either of our presenters? If not, I would like to thank all of you, uh, everybody who attended. Um, if anybody had any problems logging on or trying to get onto the uh, onto the uh, session, please let me know. This again was our first time we've done this. We want to make sure there's no impediments for uh, people getting on. Also, if you are interested in volunteering at either one of these programs or volunteering with the uh, with the friends, uh, you can contact me. Uh, my email address is just webmaster at coastalrefuges.org. And if you're interested in um, donating or in volunteering, you can contact me and I'll make sure it gets uh, forwarded on to the right person. And then everybody who is here, uh, will I'll, get you, I'll send you a link as soon as we es establish where these uh, videos are going to be posted for people to look at them again or to share with people who didn't get a chance to join us tonight. Rick? Yes. Hi, hi Walt here. Quick question. I was trying to type a chat but I couldn't get through it fast enough. Quick question for Catherine and then a follow-up on Chris is that Catherine I was amazed at the range of the terrapin turtles from Cape Cod all the way to Corpus Christi and having lived in many places along there all the way up to Cape Cod 
I assume that there are similar groups with similar concerns and similar goals to your TERPS group. Is, is there any group that organizes between them and may have dealt with coastal highways and how that's worked? Is there any kind of, uh, of group that covers, say, the East Coast, the Atlantic and Gulf Coast? There is. We, uh, as a group of mainly scientists, not exclusively, but mainly, we are called the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. We coordinate um, concerns and efforts uh, from all the way, we, we're broken into regions. There's the Northeast region, the Mid-Atlantic region. We are part of the Southeast region. Jordan and I are currently the uh, regional representatives of the Southeast region. And then there is the Florida region, uh, and there is the Gulf Coast region. So we do coordinate our efforts because we have similar yet different concerns based on uh, some of the activities. You know, we don't have in our particular Southeast region, we don't have oil concerns, but there are some oil concerns, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico. We don't have cold weather concerns, but they do have some of those in the Northeast. You know, so, so, but we are universally concerned about crab traps because that is, of course, in Maryland, that was a bigger concern that's even a heavier fishery. It was a much bigger commercial fishery up north. Um, so we, but we do concern, we coordinate those uh, issues naturally. But it, so, is yeah. it the same species, very similar species up and down the coast? Uh, for the Currently, Germans? Yes, currently they are considered the same same genus, same species, and by region they are broken into subspecies. Okay. So basically, you could you could consider them all one species, but those small variations uh, okay. by region are dealt with in subspecies. Because in Chris's, she was talking about various species or types of sea turtles and how they are very regional specific. That, that we're, we are home to one heat in this area, but other ones are closer to other areas farther south, say. Uh, yes. But I assume that, again, there's a commonality of interest in sea turtles too, that the concerns are pretty much universal regardless of what area you're in. And obviously working together, everyone can probably do more if there's some kind of, of or overriding organization that can coordinate responses to all the challenges that there are. Is that true, Chris? Yes, um, we, we also have um, regional groups that are that are set up to, you know, that are just study the regional areas. Um, we are part of the Georgia Sea Turtle Cooperative and they organ like all of the beaches in Georgia have some sort of nesting, nest protection conservation program, but also South Carolina has the same North, uh, North Carolina and also Florida. But regionally, we are part of um, uh, SourceDom, the Southeastern Regional Sea Turtle Meeting Group. And we meet usually every, every other year um, to that we also talk about regional uh, conservation issues with sea turtles as well. And then there's also the, the International Sea Turtle Symposium where worldwide we get together once a year and discuss all kinds of sea turtle um, conservation issues. And usually that's represented by over like 65 different countries and over a thousand people. You guys are doing excellent work. It's, it's really amazing what you guys oh. are doing, how, how, how effective it is and how hard you're working on it. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, uh, which now, lots island, of awesome support. <laughs> which barrier island has the most nests? I know you had 2,500 nests in, in Georgia this year, and, and ours were like 300 and some. So, what what island is the uh, the most popular with the loggerheads? Cumberland, Cumberland. I think Osaba only beat Cumberland once. Not that it's a competition, <laughs> but I will go there. Um, Osaba beat Cumberland once and we're usually fourth or fifth down the line, but this year we beat Blackbeard who's usually third. And uh, so Blackbeard came in fourth and we came in third. <laughs> and next Catherine. year we're really expecting like an explosive, the whole coast is gearing up for what we suspect is gonna be another record year. So fingers crossed. I want that necklace. I do too. <laughs> Every year, DNR uh, makes a makes a uh, 
a coveted Asaba hog tooth necklace for whoever gets the closest in, in guessing how many nests that Georgia will have. And, and everybody wants it. <laughs> All right. Adrian, this is Sandy Tyler. I just want to say that I'm always impressed with your knowledge and involvement with the Terps group and thank Jordan you. Gray. And I thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, well, uh, we don't have any other questions coming in. A couple of comments, excellent presentation. Thank you, wonderful presentation. Those are always good to hear. Um, so I think we can uh, get ready to sign off at this point. Uh, next month, uh, second Tuesday, same time, same place. Uh, we're going to have either the presentation from uh, Fish and Wildlife or from uh, Diana Churchill on winter birding on, along the coast. Uh, we do have to work out the schedule on that, but I think this was a good start for this series. I'm looking forward to it and having some very uh, in, some very good educational programs. Catherine and, and Chris, in particular, thank you so much for the effort you put in and uh, staying on. Uh, uh, on time budget so that all worked out mm -hmm. and it's just a little bit after eight and we're ready to close out so unless anybody has any final comments we can go and uh, shut down for the evening thank you so much thank you very much Thanks for having us have a great evening Thanks. bye you too <laughs> <laughs>